Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, March 21st, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Orich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier came across an interesting script while hunting for malware on VirusTotal. In this case, Xavier was looking for scripts using PSExec. This tool is often used to pivot internally once an attacker compromised a system, but of course it's also a legitimate tool to administer remotely. In this case, Xavier didn't retrieve malware. Instead, he found a script that looked more like something a system administrator created to manage remote systems. The executable was compiled using AutoIT. AutoIT is a scripting language that can be used to create executables that automate various administrative tasks. The output of AutoIT is a binary executable, but it's pretty easy to decompile these executables to recreate the source code of the script. Normally, that wouldn't really be a big deal for a simple administrative script. But in this case, the administrator creating the script hard coded the administrator password into the script. There are really two lessons to be learned here. First of all, do not upload confidential data to VirusTotal. VirusTotal does give full access to all uploaded files to researchers. In this case, actually, it was recognized as malicious by some virus tools, probably because, well, it used auto IT, it used PSXEC, which often is done in malicious scripts. Secondly, try not to hard code credentials into scripts. In this particular case, due to how the credentials were passed on the command line to PSXEC, the credentials will also be exposed and clear on the network. Xavier provides a link to a SANS forensic blog post with more details as to how to avoid including credentials in your scripts. Apple closed a privacy hole in its WebKit library, which is used by Safari and other browsers to render web pages. The problem feature here is HTTP strict transport security. This feature was introduced to provide additional security. A web page can use this feature to signal that it is only accessible via HTTPS. The first time a user visits a web page, the page returns a special header to indicate that it is only reachable via HTTPS. A browser will remember the setting and in the future it will refuse to connect to an HTTP version of the page. This will make it much harder to impersonate sites by creating HTTP copies of them. However, this feature can also be used to detect if a user already visited a particular site. And advertisers started to use this feature to track users. Advertisers will, for example, include one or more images using customized host names and then set the strict transport security header. Returning users will not re retrieve the image via HTTP, but instead switch to HTTPS, which can then be used to identify them. Apple decided to counter this technique, being more selective how the strict transport security header is applied. Using an algorithm similar to the algorithm it used to block suspect cookies, Apple will not accept the strict transport security header if the host name protected by it appears to be used for tracking. So these are these long random host names that would typically show up. If you are using the header on your website, you should be okay, but it may be a good idea to include the include subdomain flag in this setting, which then of course will protect all subdomains. And in this way, the header cannot really be used for tracking and should be considered benign by WebKit. Synopsys created a number of scanning tools to test software for security flaws. One of these products, Coverty, 
is made accessible for free to open source projects. All you have to do is to sign up with Synopsys and then allow it to access your GitHub account to scan your code. But uh, well, uh, for the last month, the tool was all of a sudden no longer available. And it turns out the Synopsys had to do this after a learning of a breach of its systems. As we see often these days, a crypto coin miner was actually added to the Coverty website. And when Synopsys found out about this, well, uh, they decided to take the site down to investigate it fully. They don't think any user data was compromised, but they still suggest that users change their password. When it comes to vulnerabilities in web applications, recently a lot of them have been found in APIs used by JavaScript or mobile apps. In a recent blog post for Lightning Security, an interesting and likely common vulnerability is discussed in webhooks used to interact with payment systems like Stripe. A uh, webhook is really a special API that sites like payment providers can use to notify a merchant of a payment. In this particular case, the merchant used Stripe, a common provider of payment services. If a user orders a product, they are redirected to Stripe, they pay via Stripe, and then Stripe uses this webhook to tell the merchant that the payment was received. Now, this is not a problem at all with what Stripe does. Stripe digitally signs the data, it can authenticate itself, but what happens is that these authentication mechanisms and digital signatures aren't verified by the merchant. These APIs are often not exposed to the end user, so the end user, unless they start digging, like in this case, as part of a bug bounty program, they will never really see these APIs, these webhooks. And as a result, well, I guess developers feel safe and do not actually do any validation. But well, as so often, secrets often don't stay secrets for long. And uh, these webhooks can be found by an attacker who can then spoof the messages coming from the payment provider. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.